Um, welcome everybody. Um, we are having today the Q&A session with Professor Brennan for the chapter two in the uh, of the standards in the context of our study group. So uh, we are well happy to have uh, have you, Professor Brennan, here. Um, I would like to start with a little introduction about Professor Brennan. And with Professor Brennan, we also agree that he will do some presentation at the after like. Um, at the beginning of this, and then he will respond to the question that I shared with him by email, based on the question that we provided in the Envision board and some other questions that appear during the discussion session. And after that, um, after Professor Brennan responding to the question, then we are going to have like a moment to do questions on the fly and have more like uh, dynamic interaction with the Professor Brennan. So, well, oh, Professor Brennan, uh, he's the EF Linguist Chair of Measurement and Testing in the College of Education at the University of Iowa. He's the founding director of the Center of Advanced Studies in Measurement and Assessment, CASMA. Uh, um, he was the director of the Iowa testing programs at the University of Iowa between uh, 1994 and 2002. Uh, Professor Brennan graduated, graduated from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And well, I mean, Professor Ren has like a very, very uh, amazing trajectory. Uh, Professor Renan is also very known for uh, authoring uh, at least two books on general generalizability theory. And he, he also co-authored um, a book with, about test equating. Professor Renan also was um, the editor of the fourth edition of Educational Measurement, which is, Huge. I mean, it's our Bible. <laughs> and uh, Professor Rena has published like numerous articles uh, in journals like Educational Measurement and like many other important uh, journals. Uh, Professor Rena participated in also numerous professional organizations. Um, he was actually president of NCME in 1995, 95, 97, in that period. He was vice president of Division D of um, American Education Research Association. And in, two, in the 2000s, he received an award actually uh, for uh, career contributions to educational measurement uh, from NCME. In 2004, he received also the um, Linguist Award for Outstanding Achievement in Educational Measurement. And in 2011, he received a Career, Achieve career Achievement Award from the Association of Test Publishers. And also Professor Renan participated as a reviewer of the, some of the chapters in the 1999 version of the standards. And most recently he wrote a chapter about generalizability theory in the book, The History of Educational Measurement, which is like more recent. So Professor Renan, I mean, thank you very much to accept participating in, in, our, in our initiative. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we can have any better person to respond to our questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I looked at uh, the questions that were sent to me and thought about the issue, issues that were being raised and decided that I really can't respond to the questions without uh, making sure that we all have a common understanding of context, or at least as I see the context. So I prepared a set of slides that I'd like to go through to give you a context that will provide a basis for at least my comments at various points about questions that, that you have raised. And then we should have time for, for some more questions as well. So I've never done this before this way, but I think this is, this is the best, best way to do it uh, for this purpose. So if you bear with me, uh, I'm anything but a technology wizard, but I think I'll be smart enough to at least be able to share a screen. Let's see what happens. Uh, now, this. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, and so if I go to slideshow, you should see that too. How are we doing? Yes, now we can see you in presentation mode. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so we're talking about the standards for education and psychological testing. 
and particularly chapter two on reliability, precision, and errors of measurement. And I thought, first of all, it's a good idea to have a kind of big overview of, of uh, what's gone on in the field and how it's been documented. So there are four editions of educational measurement. They have occurred about every 20 years. The first was edited by Lindquist in 15. Actually, the plan was to do that in about 45, but World War II intervened. Then uh, a good colleague of his, Thorndike from Columbia, edited the second edition in 71. Bob Lynn, the third in 89. And I edited the fourth in 2006. The fifth is now under consideration with Linda Cook and Mary Petoniak at, at ETS. At a, in the same time frame, there have been six editions of the Standards for Educational Life Psychological Tests. So roughly speaking, every 20 years, there's a new edition of Ed Measurement. Every 10 years, there's a new edition of the Standards, roughly speaking. Crombach uh, was the principal person for the first one in 1954. There were three after that. And then in 99, Eva Baker and Paul Sackett kind of chaired the committee. And in 2014, the standard you're, you're looking at, uh, Barbara Blake and Laurie Wise chaired the committee. So that's, if you, wanted, if you wanted to actually know what's gone on in the last 70 plus years of the field, uh, one thing you might do is read all of that. Um, I have read all of it, literally all of it, at one time or another. <clears throat> the standards in 2014, talking about reliability and precision, are, are clustered into four, uh, into eight different clusters. And if you notice, uh, those clusters, uh, four of them, uh, explicitly refer to reliability slash precision, four of them. Actually, they all refer to it in one sense. But you see that phrase going on, on, going on all the time. So what, what's going on there? Well, I wasn't on the committee that wrote those standards. But when I read through it, it seems pretty clear what's going on. When they use the word reliability, what they're really referring to is coefficients, I think, largely. When they use the word precision, what they're really refer referring to is standard errors of measurement or conditional standard errors of measurement. I'll have more to say about this in, in a while. From the point of view of the chapter, essentially both reliability and precision are given similar standing, although I would say coefficients seem to predominate in their thinking. That's the way it looks to me when I, when I read it. Now, what about me? Well, some of the context and challenges with the standards, uh, and maybe this will give you a, an overview, uh, hopefully, of thinking about this whole enterprise. First of all, I should note that uh, I was president of NCNE and also AERA Division D vice president uh, in the mid-1990s. I was never on the standards committee per se, but I did have an involvement in the standards, and namely in uh, in part um, appointing people, in part reviewing things and, th and stuff like that. So I wasn't completely disassociated. There has always been tensions that exist in the standards. And the tensions are in part, large part, associated with the fact that you have three distinct organizations, APA, AERA, and NCME. And they don't share a common perspective always with respect to what the standards are, should be, et cetera. So for that reason, the three organizations appoint members and the un in the end, they're supposed to come up with some kind of consensus. But there is differing personnel involved. The funding sources has been a source of contention. That's actually a story all in and of itself, how the funding happens. Uh, and the goals and context are different. So the standards for educational and psychological testing, I don't think have any precedent with respect to standards in other fields, other academic fields, where the focus is much more coherent. There is in particular a very large gap between psychological testing and educational testing. 
um, including licensure and certification. So in a sense, you might say that the standards uh, have the following characteristics. First of all, there's no enforcement mechanism. If, if you prove that somebody violates the standards, there's nobody to complain to, no entity. There is some minimal legal standing for the standards. They don't have strict legal standing, but if court cases arise, it is often the case that the standards will be quoted by one or more experts in the context of a court case. There's no certification and measurement professionals. So a doctorate is really not commensurate with certification. Uh, think of medicine, for example, just because you graduate from med school doesn't mean that you get licensed to practice as a physician. Same with law school. So there's no enforcement mechanism. It has minimal legal standard and there's no certification and measurement professionals. The sum total of all of these things creates a pretty complicated circumstance in which essentially what's going on is the various entities who meet together as a standards committee have as their mandate to come up with some kind of consensus on these things. But that consensus typically involves give and take. So there's not one perspective on a lot of these things. And that creates, in my mind, a very ambiguous status for what you might see in, in many aspects of the standards. Given that limitation, I don't want you to assume that I therefore think the 2014 standards are terrible. They aren't. I think given the, given the many constraints the committee had to deal with, the standards are really quite good, but they're not always as clear and focused as I would ideally like to see in, um, in educational testing. At least that would be my, my perspective. <clears throat> so let's consider again as well, the, the broad complicated and politicized context of educational testing. We sometimes forget about this. Um, We've got various levels, K through eight, obviously, grades nine through 12, there's college admissions. There, uh, is a, there are admissions to professional graduate schools, medicine, law, measurement, et cetera. And there's licensure and certification, especially in medicine and law. Now you could argue, well, some of these, maybe they shouldn't fall under the banner of educational testing, but the reality is they really do. And the reality is those of you who are students, when you start looking for jobs, you'll probably be looking for jobs and, and or taking a job in one or more of those uh, four areas at one time or another. I have personally worked in every one of them. And they are very, very different. Other issues that creep in that create complexities, political and technical. In the case of grades three through 12, peer review by the feds drives much of what's going on in, in uh, grades three through 12 testing. College admissions testing is highly politicized now and mixed with state testing programs because of the Every Student Succeeds Act. That wasn't the case uh, up until uh, just before when No Child Left Behind was in play in the early 2000s or even before that. Virtually all educational tests are multidimensional by design which differentiates them very much from many psychological assessments, which are univariate by design. In the context of education, we have summative assessment and formative, formative assessment. Formative assessment isn't actually considered, as far as I can tell, in the standards, except, interestingly, it is an entry in a glossary, but there's no standards that have to do with it, as far as I can tell. And finally, I think we all know if we've been in this field for very long, that there is a kill the messenger mentality to all educational testing. In other words, if the, if the results of the testing lead to some consequence that people don't like, then the knee jerk reaction is to blame the test. So all of those issues are in play and they create compl considerable complexity in politicizing the context of educational testing. And I think you need to be aware of that when you're viewing standards and the context that in, within which we all exist. 
I like the next two quotes, uh, both because I agree with them, but also because they, they capture some issues about history that I think are important. Uh, most of you, certainly all of you know about Cronbach's Alpha. You may not know that unless things have changed in recent years, the Cronbach Alpha 1951 paper <clears throat> is the most cited paper in the social science literature. It's used everywhere. But in 2004, shortly before he died, Kronbach wrote his final paper in educational and psychological measurement with the assistance then of Rich Shavelson, who was a former student of his. And one of the things he said was, I doubt with a coefficient alpha is the best way of judging reliability. And I, he's actually being quite gentle there. He meant it more strongly, I think. I think what he really meant is it definitely is not the best way in almost all cases. He also stated coefficients are a crude device, including reliability coefficients. Interpretations being made in current assessments are best evaluated through the use of a standard error of measurement. So his first quote is casting doubt on coefficient alpha, for sure. And his second quote is actually expanding that doubt to all coefficients, saying in effect, that they're too complex, they're too difficult to evaluate and standard errors of measurement make a whole lot more sense. I personally buy into both of those perspectives. Alpha itself is barely mentioned in the 2014 standards, except to say, again, as I believe in the glossary. On the other hand, alpha is still widely used, which in and of itself suggests a kind of lack of adherence to the standards. In other words, what's often being done to support issues of reliability with respect to educational testing, namely reporting coefficient alpha, is not something that's actually endorsed in the standards. And I think we all know why it's used so frequently. It's very easy to compute because it's been around so long, people think they know what it means. They don't, most of them, I don't think, but it's still there. Coefficients are still given considerable attention in the, 19, in the 2014 standards. So I think that fact in and of itself would conflict with that second quote by Crumbach. <clears throat> um, just as an aside, I'll, speaking solely for myself, when I wrote um, my book on G theory, and then I wrote it in the 1990s, I seriously considered not including any reference to generalizability coefficients because I thought they were too much overused and standard errors of measurement would make more sense. I decided against that because I felt that if I didn't include them at those stage, at that stage, probably no one would have read the book uh, because everybody wanted measures of reliability or estimates of them. Okay, a couple of more of my perspectives here. Some fundamental issues. There is no such thing as the reliability of a test. I can't count the number of times I've had to point this out in all sorts of ways. Most recently in the context of an evaluation, I played a big part in of use of the GRE along with the uh, graduate school admissions, uh, the, uh, the use of the GRE along with the LSAT for admissions into law school. Perhaps the single most public and even professional misunderstanding is there that is that tests possess reliability. They do not. It is test scores that have reliability to some degree. Furthermore, it's almost always scale scores that matter, not raw scores. And the reason is in almost all circumstances, the scores that are reported that are used as the basis for making decisions about students and other entities are scale scores. So knowing something about reliability or standard error of measurement for raw scores may be an interesting sidelight but it's not relevant to the decisions that are made. It is scale scores that matter. The essence of reliability considerations, I think, is to deal with questions such as, 
what constitutes a replication of a measurement procedure and how variable our examinees reported scores, usually scale scores, over replications. The second one is at the heart of issues of quote unquote reliability as I think about them. How variable our examinees reported scores over replications. We get into all sorts of estimation issues, obviously. Uh, I would say that estimated reliability like coefficients are much overused and largely misinterpreted. Estimates of SEMs, particularly conditional SEM, should be a central concern. And I do give considerable credit to the Standards Committee for giving something on the order of equal emphasis to SEMs and CSEMs, although they, they refer to it typically with respect to precision. Another aspect of precision from the point of view of the standards is decision consistency, which does play an important role in many circumstances, especially if you're dealing with categorizations such as basic proficient advance or even pass fail, then decision consistency plays a big role. Estimation methodology probably has become the predominant aspect of reliability precision as it's in terms of publications these days. And it's obviously important, but it's only as good as the defensive as the assumptions are with respect to their defensibility. And I think too frequently um, the assumptions are overlooked and almost as if they don't matter that much, but they really do matter a lot. So I would prefer if our field moved back closer to paying attention to those things that are very central to very notions of reliability precision, and in particular, how variable are examinees reported scores over replications. How you go about doing that definitely requires estimation, but I don't think estimation should stand out as the principal thing. Now we're beginning to get into, the, into questions. The, the questions that I received from Sergio, many of them were focused on who's the user here? Well, one of the reasons I just gave that background is to kind of point to the obvious. Uh, the multiplicity of perspectives that have to be re represented by the standards for educational and psychological testing kind of indicate pretty clearly that there are multiple users, testing companies, the feds, states, districts, schools, parents, students, admissions offices, professional associations, media. So if you just, a superficial reading of the standards suggests that, well, user means the person who ultimately uses the scores. And that's not wrong per se, but it really misses the fact that there are multiple different types of users depending upon the context within which you are dealing. And obviously those different entities or people associated with them will have vastly different knowledge bases for reliability, standard errors of measurement, et cetera. <clears throat> and each of those Groups typ typically have different, differing levels of responsibilities. Uh, and all of this leads to considerable confusion and potential lack of accountability, which I think was one of the things that was confusing to those of you who wrote questions about who is the user, which is a very good question. And this, the standards are really pretty much silent about that. Not because these people, I think, don't understand that. I, don't, I know they understand that. But because given the political nature of the standards and the manner in which you've got three entities involved in them, it's practically impossible to piece out who's responsible for what. And so they, they use the generic statement, uses. My personal belief is that testing companies should be the primary but not exclusive responsibility for the uses of test scores. And that responsibility depends heavily on timely, accurate, and useful documentation written for various users. 
Uh, my principal complaint about testing companies these days is that far too many of them are grossly violating that quote unquote standard. That is, they are not providing timely, accurate, and useful information for various users. I can think of one testing program that hasn't really revised its documentation for 30 years. Um, it's very challenging to deal with documentation, but it we don't do it, the field does not do it terribly well. And that's really unfortunate. A little bit of a notion about measurement models, because I think you need to have some perspective on this in order to deal with some of the questions you have. They're kind of form-based models uh, in which items and or other measurement conditions are random. That's what's going on in classical test theory, where they're all errors clumped into one E term. Uh, and univariate generalizability theory splits out that one E term into multiple parts. Multivariate G theory actually does the same thing, but in addition, it splits out true score into multiple parts. Item-based models, IRT, the principal difference of between or among them and the form-based models, what I'm calling form-based models above, is that items are fixed entities in IRT models. Items are not fixed entities in form-based models. So there's, that, and that is a big distinction. IRT is based upon a strong true score theory, essentially, in which uh, ability theta is as an arbitrary distribution. There's no right distribution. It is often the case that it's assumed to be normal but there's nothing in the theory that requires that. And obviously you all know that if you're using IRT, you've got to pick a pre-specified functional form for the item. So one parameter model, a two parameter model, three parameter model, et cetera. Importantly, for the most part, just about all of IRT as it's currently used assumes a univ univariate model. That is, it assumes a single theta. There are arguments about that, but for the most part, that's the case. Multivarious models have been discussed for decades, at least uh, five decades that I know of, uh, but they're not much used in actual practice, at least not yet. So the two sets of models are fundamentally different. I often talk about them in, in, in terms of a forest trees metaphor. The form-based model is essentially you see the forest, but you don't see the individual trees. The IRT models, you see the individual trees, items, but you, don't, you may miss, miss the forest. Arguments over a right model are just misguided and misinformative, but the choice of a model can substantially influence perspectives and how you estimate error variance. There are often better, worse answers, but there are seldom right answers, uniformly right answers. In any case, reported statistics should match the uses and interpretations that are intended. A second class of questions that I saw had to do with what I thought were a conditional standard errors of measurement. But the questions themselves with one exception, I think, did not specify whether the people who wrote the questions were thinking about it from the point of view of raw scores or scale scores. And as I said, I think the focus really needs to be on scale scores, conditional SEMs for scale scores. So I'd like to give you a, a kind of perspective on some basic ideas here using a couple of papers um, that I was involved in uh, in, the, in the 1990s, which are still being rel still relevant and still used. The first one with Mike Cohen, Brad Hansen, and me uh, could be viewed as using classical theory or G theory along with a beta-4 compound binomial model. And essentially what goes on is using procedures that I discussed later in 2001, you get raw score CSEMs for any particular person. 
And you also have um, use of a two term approximation to a compound binomial model with those raw scores. That gives you a distribution of observed scores given true score. Then you have a raw score to scale score conversion table that allows you to transform raw scores to scale scores. So now you've got a distribution of scale scores given a true score. You can get the standard deviation of that thing. And that is a, that is a conditional standard error of measurement. And if you want to, you can integrate over a beta four distribution of true scores and you can get overall statistics. So the, the essential idea here is that you start out using raw scores in order to employ a compound binomial model that permits you to ultimately get to a distribution of scale scores for a given true score. That's a conditional SEM and you can do a lot of things after that. IRT essentially follows the same procedure. Uh, Mike Cohen, uh, Zhang and, and Hansen in 96, four years later, basically took this framework and they just applied it to IRT. In that context, you use the Lord Wingersky recursion formula to get a distribution of reserve scores given theta. And you use a raw score to scale score conversion table to get the corresponding distribution of scale scores given theta standard deviation of which is a conditional standard error of measurement. And then if you want to, you can integrate over theta and get overall standard errors of measurement. So these are two ways in which you can uh, go about the process of getting uh, conditional SEMs for scale scores. And I'm emphasizing scale scores because I think the standards don't emphasize them enough. And almost always it is scale scores that are the basis on which decisions are made, which means that we should be computing statistics that relate to scale score distributions. At least that's my perspective. And then I ended with some, um, a set of references about various things I've mentioned and a few others that I've found to be useful. Perhaps you would find them to be useful as well. I think there's one more, one more slide after that, that uh, is just notes for myself, which you can forget about if you want for now. So that's kind of my, my perspective on things. The standards are not, I think, what most people think they are without having some background. They really are statements of some degree of consensus in perspectives among three quite different uh, testing organizations. And for that reason, they, don't always um, answer questions that, about which people would like very direct answers. What should I do in this particular case? Who was responsible for doing this? Things like that. Still, uh, under the circumstances the standards committees have had to function under, all of them just about, they do a pretty good job of capturing uh, a consensus. The problem is a consensus statement isn't necessarily what people really want if they're dealing in particular contexts, uh, such as you may if you're dealing with educational testing grades three through eight, or licensure and certification testing um, in another context. Okay, thank you for bearing with me with respect to that. I hope that gives you something of perspective at least as I see it, uh, with respect to chapter two and with respect to the, stand, to the standards itself. So, so as you are, I'll, I'll leave it to you to see yes. what you want to do next. Thank you very much, Professor Brennan. This was very, very good. Um, so I think now we can um, open uh, Open the opportunity for students to do questions. Uh, hopefully, uh, you can do your question in less than two minutes, so we can have already like a chance to do questions. And yeah, um, and yeah, I'm 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 not going to like uh, do any more sophisticated procedure. Just jump in and do your question if you, uh -huh. if you want to talk. 
Uh, thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. That was one of the most um, valuable, uh, informative, interesting uh, session that I have ever heard. Um, right. Uh, my name is Gunel. I am doing my master's at Kent State University. My major is um, research, measurement, and statistics. Uh, right now, I'm taking course uh, like IRT, and we are learning um, about rush analysis, uh, and we need to apply rush analysis in our final projects, the final proposals. So I would like to know your opinion about uh, using rush analysis to evaluate evaluate the reliability. Uh, what, uh, like, as I understand from your uh, presentation, uh, there is never right or exact answer for um, reliability, but um, what would you prefer? Uh, if we want to check reliability in our test, uh, is rush analysis one of the best ways to do that? Okay. Well, the first question I would be asking myself, and I all, let me back off a bit. One complaint I have had about our field um, yeah, over time is that, it is the following. There, there was a time when the people who were doing test development and the psychometricians were sometimes the same people but or at least they worked very close together. What has happened over time is that those two enterprises have been separated, uh, not, a, not only in terms of the people doing them, but also in terms of even where they're doing them. So they don't even come in contact with each other very often. I think that's very, very unfortunate. So anyone who's ever worked with for me or with me knows that I insist that if you're going to start tell, telling me something about uh, psychometric characteristics of test scores, you better be able to tell me what the test is and what it is supposed to be measuring. So um, I don't think that one of the IRT models is necessarily better than another generally. I do think there are circumstances in which one model may be better than another because among other things, it may better map what the perspective is about that which is being tested. So for me, if what is being tested can be viewed as relatively unidimensional without too much complaint, I think the RASH model can make sense. It is certainly in many respects much simpler to use. Um, if that's not the case, then I think you have to either argue that um, discrimination differences, dimensionality don't matter, or then it may be the case that results that you obtain using the RASH model may not be optimal. Now, there can be many other issues that are coming into play though. One of them is sample size. You know, for the most part, there are various different standards, but most people would say something like, if you're gonna use a 3PL model, you need a few thousand examinees. 2PL model, you might be able to get away with a thousand. Rosh model, you might be able to get away with 500. I mean, there, you can argue that for a long time, but that's something like what you, what you tend to, will tend to hear. So those are among the things that I would consider. I do not, I do not prescribe too much to notions of adopting a model first before considering the consequences down the road. Um, I will tell you that if all other things being equal, if I were responsible for using IRT to do analyses with respect to errors of measurement, reliability, 
I would be more likely to go with a 2PL model than any of the others. 3PL model, I think the, the lower asymptote is a big problem in the model. Um, it's a problem conceptually, I think, but it's also a problem in terms of estimation. The 1PL model, I think, may be too simplistic for many contexts in educational testing. But I wouldn't make those statements so definitively that I would always rule them out from consideration of what to do in a particular context. Does that help at all? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm so sorry, I, I'm taking uh, time. Um, can we uh, get your presentation? Um, uh, can you s share your presentation with us later? Yes. Sergio, um, is it possible? Oh, yes. Uh, what I will do, assuming Sergio is agreeable to it, is... Um, that last slide, which had a few notes on it, I'll drop that off, but I will send you, I didn't send you a copy, did I, Sergio? Okay, I will just send you a copy, um, the PowerPoint presentation, and uh, uh, I'll probably put something on the front end, that some kind of qualifier on the first page, and uh, you can distribute it to, um, to all of the participants. Well, we, I have no trouble with that, if you're agreeable to it. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Professor Renan. Any other question, please? Um, hello, Professor Brennan. Um, thank you for your presentation. And my you're name welcome. is Ashley. <laughs> my name is Ashley, a PhD student at UBC. My major is measurement evaluation and research methodology. Um, and I got a chance to roughly review the use of SEM and CSEM in validation studies uh, in four journals. And I found that CSEM is rarely reported. And I'm wondering uh, whether it is because there are no user-friendly tools to get it. And um, there seems to be no guidance on the reporting of CSEM. Yeah. Is, there, there yeah. really is not much guidance on reporting of SEM, conditional SEMs. Um, I, I share, I think if we were to talk further, I would find out that I share concerns. If you asked me to pick one and only one statistic in, in psychometrics to pay attention to, it would be conditional SEMs. That's what I would pick. Um, mm. If I have those, I can do all sorts of things with them, including uh, uh, very traditional things and very non-traditional things, but also they almost always are getting at the focus of what is really of interest to me. Namely, I would like to be able to say to an examinee who takes a test, here's your score. And I'm relatively confident of that in the sense of it ranges you know, from, from here to here. Um, and I'll tell you how unconfident I might be as well. So I tend to think that's the case. If I were the author of chapter two, if I had been the author, sole author of chapter two, I would have ordered things starting with conditional SEMs, then going to SEMs, and then going to error tolerance ratios, and then going to coefficients. And the last two are functionally related. But error tolerance ratios, uh, which have been proposed by, by others as well, particularly Mike Kane, error tolerance ratios are just much easier to understand than a coefficient. Um, to give you an idea about my qualifications with respect to a coefficient, I know of no one, myself included, who can tell me what the difference is between a reliability of coefficient of 0.95 and 90, and then tell me what the difference is between a reliability coefficient of 0.85 and 80. They have substantially different meanings intuitively, but intuitively I cannot understand that difference. I can mathematically tell you how to do it, but I can't intuitively grasp it. Um, so I, 
that hangs me up. When conditional SEMs, I think I know what I'm talking about. But that's the way I order things in terms of priorities. Conditional SEMs, SEMs, error tolerance ratios, coefficients. And in what I'm writing now, that's what I'm doing. Um, if people don't want to publish my stuff because I don't do it the way they want it, well, I've been around long enough, so it probably won't make too much difference. But um, that really is the way, I'm, the way I'm thinking about things. Well, thank you for your response. I really want to no. say but... <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any other question, please? Hello, Dr. Brandon. Uh, my name is Bai Chen, and uh, I'm also a PhD student from the SYNC program at SASHI. And uh, I have two very curious questions. And one is about, uh, you mentioned that the reliability doesn't matter for the row score. Uh, it's a problem for the scale score. And I'm thinking that if we based on the rush model, as the other student mentioned, in that case, is the estimation should be the very similar to the, like the row score. So in that case, is there a problem? Like the why we just need to consider the scale score is a matter. And the other thing is you mentioned that the mm, we have the like the difference between the G theory and the RT models. Is one is the forest, the other is the tree. Uh, is that problem is about the estimation because IRT used the each responses and the G theory used the MSE, the mean score error, something like that. Right. Um, I don't think, I think you're asking the question from methodological perspectives and I'm tempted to want to respond to them from, from more, um, more general perspectives. See if I can, first of all, I've got to make sure I get your question right. The, the RASH model, the first one was about the RASH model. The RASH model is simple enough, so it is surely the case that uh, differences in um, raw score SAMs and scale score SAMs may be easier to deal with, but they are not going to be the same thing. Um, you know, a, a scales, the rawest, they're going to depend upon a rawest scale score transformation. There is no constraint on what that transformation is. It doesn't have to be linear. In fact, it's almost never linear. It's nonlinear and sometimes it's dramatically nonlinear. So I don't think it's going, the difference is going to evaporate just because of the simplicity of the Rash model, because the, the Rada scale score transformation is unaffected by the Rash model, unless you employ something on top of it. Um, and your second question I, um, had to do with, I'm sorry, I, I think I've forgotten the details. The second question had to do with scale scores, but what, what, what were you getting? Uh, so you mentioned the difference between the G-theory and IRT. Oh. Why is the forest, why is the tree? <laughs> yeah, the forest tree issue. That to me is a very helpful metaphor. Um, IRT, You know, in conventional ways of developing test tests, you do item analysis, difficulty level discrimination, and then you go along, you create forms and you do equating and you do all sorts of other stuff after that. IRT kind of mixes everything in together. And there is, by the way, historically a reason why I think that's, that has happened, just, just out of, by way of background. Uh, obviously, Fred Lloyd was the, if not the driving force, at least a driving force in the, in the development of IRT. When Fred Lloyd started at ETS, he was responsible for test development, item development. Uh, so he was very interested in those kinds of things. He was focusing on items a lot. Uh, and that, that really influenced him. The other thing that influenced him is he was focusing on it with the old SAT, which by construction was unidimensional. And people forget that. So Fred Lord's thinking of, I care about items in a unidimensional framework. And he developed very elegant ways of looking at that. And then Birnbaum came, around, came along and gave us ways to estimate parameters in those models. Um, that's not what's really going on these days anymore. 
there's almost no educational test that really uh, on the surface satisfies an assumption of unidimensionality. It's very great. Unless you get down to, you know, spelling in the third grade. Uh, maybe that's unidimensional. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit different. Um, so scale scores, and remember, Rodis, the Rodis scale score conversion can be anything, literally anything. You, you decide what, what to do uh, with, with respect to that. Um, and for me, when I look at what I view um, measurement through the lens of generalizability theory, I'm not seeing items. I'm seeing forms, the forest. When I view psychometrics through the lens of IRT, not only am I seeing items and their, or their characteristics, that's the unit that I'm really manipulating to get to results, right? So in a sense, in G theory or classical theory, the items are kind of interchangeable. In IRT, the items are definitely not interchangeable. The, the structure of the whole enterprise is geared to paying attention to differences among, among items. So it's a, it's a, the, they, are, they are very different perspectives. Now, it, it's kind of unfortunate that we use a lot of the same terms in the context, in the two different contexts, because that tends to lead to more confusion than clarity. And I'm not really making an argument at this point that one, all, one way of approaching things is better or worse than another. We could have that discussion, but that's not the discussion here. My point really is that they are very different. They come from a very different uh, starting points, very different frames of reference, very different sets of assumptions. So yes, I can, can, I can estimate a conditional SEM using IRT, but I'm using assumptions that are very different. I can estimate a conditional SEM using G-theory or classical theory, but I'm using assumptions that are very different. If they come out to be quite similar, okay, that's fine. But there's nothing in the theory that guarantees that they will. And certainly they don't, uh, the interpretations that are justifiable from the two perspectives are not, not the same. That, that's how I would see it anyway. You may see it differently, but that's how I would see it. Yeah, thank you, Brennan. That's a very good answer. And uh, just uh, we're also curious about, uh, you know, they have the, like, the random item IRT. <laughs> In that case, they are like the kind of similar because item also can be treated as the random. I'm sorry, say that again, the first part. Yeah, um, basically we still have the new model called the random item IRT model. So oh. item, yes, also can be seen as the random. Yeah, in that case, what do you think about the, like the difference between the G theory and the IRT? Um, I don't really have a firm opinion on that right now. I mean, but, I, but I, I'll tell you that um, if it is possible, and I don't know that it is, someone or singular or plural is going to make a huge contribution to psychometrics if they can provide a model that incorporates coherently both G-theory and IRT perspectives. Uh, I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. It may not be possible. The two perspectives may be so different that it's not possible. But I sometimes think of this, and this is pressing things a bit far, I know, but I sometimes think of this as not unlike the arguments physicists have uh, when they're dealing with um, basically quantum theory versus classical theory, or quantum theory versus relativity theory. You know, the ideal is a superimposing model, but the, for 40, 50 years now, nobody's been able to do it. Uh, I don't know whether or not we'll be able to do that in the context we're, we're talking about. What I do feel strongly about though, is that we simply need to recognize and that there are differences and not mislead people into thinking that just because sometimes 
you use the same word conditional SEM with both of them. They were talking about identically the same thing because we're not. I think that's the way I would view it. But the research you're referring to, perhaps it will get around that problem. I don't know it well enough to make that, make that claim. I've certainly thought about this issue a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. I haven't been able to, to overcome that comment yet. Somebody smarter than me is gonna to have to do that, I think. All right, we are close to the end. Um, I wanted to do one last question uh, that is kind of related with um, the previous discussion that we had in, in the uh, validity chapter and some of the, um, the ideas that the students were thinking in that context. Because, I mean, as you explained pretty well, the standards um, are not, so there are many people interpret the standards in many different ways. And sometimes people believe that the standards are things that are not. And, but on the other side, like a lot of people are looking for something that can, something better than the standard or something more prescriptive maybe. And I wonder if you believe that, for example, having best practices or something maybe not in the standard like a document, but something that can be more prescriptive on, on what to do in certain cases could be possible to generate, like it is feasible to have a consensus. And would you think that could be helpful? I think it is possible. I think it could be helpful. Um, I can tell you that um, uh, last year, um, last year, Mike Kane, gave the Lynn Award Address for AERA Division D. And in his central or a central aspect of that address was pretty much what you were saying. He was suggesting it would be a considerable contribution if somebody wrote a book in which there were multiple chapters, each of which addressed a different perspective or approach for uh, related to best practices in doing validation. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. Uh, who's gonna be able to do it uh, is, is another thing or how you go about doing it is another thing. I've been involved, um, I've been involved in writing or various books and, or editing. I can, I can tell you in all cases for reasons I've never understood, it always takes me four years to do one. I don't know why it's four years, but it's always four years. Uh, so it's, it's a considerable commitment. And I think that actually is doable from Mike Kane's perspective on validation, which is identical to mine, which is namely, it's very simple. It's a claims evidence approach to things. In, uh, in, in issues having to do the, with uh, quote unquote reliability and precision, uh, there are so many different varieties. I don't know if a best practices approach will work, although, you know, you could do something like somebody write about those issues from the point of view, three through eight testing, college admissions testing, licensure testing, certification testing, and that, that might be something that could be done. The general idea of best practices under these circumstances, I think, um, I think could well be quite a contribution to the field. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Professor Vernon. Well, in fact, part of the ideas in which this, uh, um, part of the ideas also is in the context of rethinking the format of the standards, because typically the standard considered like a chapter or not a chapter, like a book. But now we have so much technology and maybe we don't need to be that fixed. I mean, we can use the technology to create some document that is more, uh, I don't know, like connected or uh, living if you want and a standard that can connect with other documents that have these prescriptive things or for example some people that confuse the standard with a code of ethics for example and connect with yeah. something like that yeah and that could be like a, a way to go well co a couple of comments there there is a code of professional ethics yeah. for NCME mm -hmm. there actually is one Cindy Schmeiser who succeeded me as president of NCME was the prime mover in that that actually exists um, as far as 
restructuring the standards, the, there, there is the beginning of creating a new standards committee for the next edition, next version of the standards. If you have feelings about that, I'm, I'm sure you could find a way to express them to the NCME, NCME leadership. I do think what I personally would like, as I said, of standards under the current political structure is very, very difficult to achieve because you've got these three different organizations that have really not a common shared, uh, substantially shared perspective on a lot of these things. So it's, it's really hard. Um, under the circumstances, as I said, I think the Standards Committee did a really pretty good job. Uh, even though I've been a little bit critical of some things, still I think they did a pretty good job, but it's a really tough job. Yes. All right. We are on time now. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Renan, for participating in, in our initiative. Thank you also for all the students that participated today. Um, well, you're yeah. welcome. Yes, and uh, we are going to continue uh, next, uh, it's in two weeks, uh, after Thanksgiving with the Furnas chapter. So for the students that are participating, please, I will be contacting you at email. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sergio. I wish all of you well in your careers. Yes, thank you, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.